is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Kofi Annan was always balanced, soft-spoken, but quite steely and standing for what he believed to be right. Nobody is a self-made person. It's the family that makes somebody. This house was so full of children. We were stepping on each other's toes when we were young. When we met, I was interested. I was Nan and he was Kofi. And we were together, Kofi and Nan. I, Kofi Annan. I, Kofi Annan. And in so doing, the man was now at the helm of the diplomatic world. Winning the Nobel Peace Prize and signing of Kenya's peace accord are two momentous events that define the life and times of Kofi Atta Annan. One was the apex of a civil service career spanning over five decades, and the second, what he did post-retirement. Arguably one of the most iconic African global statesmen, Kofi's international civil service career still continues to captivate the diplomatic world. The 1990s were one of the busiest periods for the United Nations as they hopped from one conflict to the next in their mission to maintain world peace. At UN headquarters in New York, Kofi had just been promoted to the role of undersecretary in the newly formed Department of Peacekeeping Operations in 1993. This promotion brought him face to face with the politics of war and peace as two major crises unfolded. First, it was the slaughter of almost one million Rwandans in 100 days in 1994. And then, within less than two years, the massacre of over 8,000 men in a UN protected safe zone. It seemed the UN had failed in its mandate and it was the Kofi Annan-led Department of Peacekeeping that would come into sharp scrutiny. In the aftermath of the genocide, General Dallaire, the then force commander of the United Nations Peacekeeping Force in Rwanda, heavily criticized the Department of Peacekeeping Operations for their slow response to act on intelligence that would have averted the genocide. When I came back to the UN to debrief about the Rwandan genocide, having uh, been withdrawn from the mission, I find it a bit ironic that I'm in the same, exactly the same room where I was in 20 years ago on September 4th. At that time, this room was not as full. And the troop contributing nations that sat around here to hear my debrief were few indeed. And in so doing, reflected so, so clearly where the world leadership was or wasn't during the Rwandan genocide. In his book, Interventions, A Life in War and Peace, Kofi wrote that the slow response to act on intelligence trickled right from the highest office of the Secretary General, thereby hindering the department's handling of the crisis. But nevertheless, Kofi would later on apologize to the people of Rwanda on behalf of the UN, stating that they had failed to avert the Rwandan genocide. It was a failure of all of us. It was our collective failure. Then this I have given, we all failed uh, Rwanda. Go, go, go. 
As if Rwanda was not enough, the massacre at Srebrenica happened. The tensions at the UN and especially the peacekeeping department were extremely high. Kofi's job as head of the department was hanging in the balance. But luckily, the wheels of fortune would begin to turn in favor of this industrious diplomat from Ghana. There is a new African in the world. That new African is ready to fight his own battle and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. As Kwame Nkrumah was taking over the reins of leadership in Ghana from the British in 1957, Kofi was transitioning from high school into college. He was enrolled to study economics at the current day Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Kofi was hardly there for a year when he received a Ford Foundation grant enabling him to finish his studies at the McAllister College in the United States. A lot was happening then and we as students often debated the issues of the day, whether it was a civil rights movement or what was happening in Africa where I had just come from and people wanting to know about the struggle for independence in Africa, which for me also dovetailed with the U.S. civil rights uh, movement. While studying, Kofi had already started to perfect the delicate art of diplomacy in dealing with discrimination. Now, I recall we were once in, uh, was it, uh, Arkansas, no, it was in Arkansas, or Kansas, on the uh, Fre uh, Ambassador for Friendship trip, where we traveled around the states from coast to coast, trying. We went into a coffee shop, and we sat at the bar, and with international group, and the, there were two ladies, one younger one and an older one, and, and I heard them saying, you tell him, you tell them you know, and back and forth. So the young one, blushing, came to tell us, I'm sorry, we don't say blacks, you know. And of course, some of my friends, we started debating, I said, look, uh, if they don't say blacks, we are wasting our time here. Uh, in the end, we, we left. But how did this natural affinity to diplomacy really begin? A journey to where Kofi's story all started is worthwhile. Situated about 250 kilometers northwest of the country's capital, Accra, Kumasi is the second largest city in Ghana. A vibrant metropolis, Kumasi has a history going back to the Neolithic age when historians described it as a thriving city with streets wide enough for two carriages to drive side by side. In this city, Kofi Atta Anand's journey started 81 years ago. This little building tucked inside the city square of Kumasi is the official home of the Anand family. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you, you're thank welcome. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming us. Thank you. Nana Brewo has been the head of the Anan family for 13 years. As the head of the house, his main role is to ensure that all the family's history and doctrines are upheld. This house was built in 1922 by my great grandmother. The house is called Ibrasu. That's Anywhere we settled, we named our house Ibrasso. Son to a father who was a stoic paramount chief from the Ashanti kingdom and a mother who hailed from the Fante royal family, Kofi and his siblings were born into royalty. It is inside this room on this very same bed that in 1938, Kofi and his twin sister, Efua Atta, were born. Overlooking the matrimonial bed are pictures of Kofi's mother and father, eternally frozen in time. The home 
brought together members of the extended family and all children who are practically raised in one place. The Anan family has continued this concept of familial unity to date. This is Kofi's extended family on the father's side, still dressed in black as symbols of mourning. They still remember the amazing song that Kofi taught them when he came home from secondary school 60 years ago. What will be, will be. We grew up together in this house. This house was so full of children. We were stepping on each other's toes when we were young. Growing up in the home, Kofi was nurtured in the royal ways of the Ashanti kingdom. This is the well. Here is where we fetch our waters from. And uh, Kofi Annan was being bathed here from this water. It's a very spiritual water because uh, anybody who drank and bathed with this in this house became successful in life. By the mid 40s, young Kofi and his twin sister Efwa Atta were attending an elementary school at the St. Cyprian Anglican Church in a building now converted into an education office. He was described as an intelligent young man who remembered everything in the list whenever he was sent to the market to shop. Kofi Annan was a very good person because in the class, most of the teachers loved him. He used to run airlines, not far. If you give him 10 attempts that do this, everything can be kept in memory. Kofi Annan was a great man. Learn something from him. Where he ended, end there, or you can go beyond. God bless you all. Kofi and his sister Efwa Atta were raised in both the mother's and the father's side of the family. Their mother came from the fishing town of Cape Coast. This town was once a slave trader's outpost of the Dutch before other European countries came much later. Cape Coast was the first capital of Ghana and held several seats of government of the Western colonizers in the 18th century. Inside this humble house, Kofi's mother lived with her extended family. Kofi and his siblings came here every schooling holiday when they were in middle school. This unfinished family house was one of Kofi's last undertaking. Isaac Hooper, who bears a striking resemblance to Kofi, is the current head of this house. He has fond memories of Kofi. This place was what dear to him. He didn't want the place to be commercialized or something. Or, so he makes sure that the family maintains the place. So uh, he asks us, what can we do? And then we are telling him, and he brings his help. And then that's what we are doing, so to keep the family one. Although Kofi had a house in Accra, his older sister's home was one of his favorite places to visit whenever he was in Ghana. His sister, Alice Adakwe, now 91 years old, and some of her children still live here. Walking into the house, one gets the overwhelming sense that they held Kofi in very high esteem. The reason why you see, touch, feel that this house is Kofi Annan's home, so far as the sister is here with the children, then that gives you the right information. Because a house or a home is made up of a family. His big portrait is like the centerpiece of the home, 
and the funeral flowers are only just being moved out almost a year later. My good memories for Mr. Kofianan was uh, when I was very little. I had a burn on my left leg. Then when he came, the leg was swollen. I was just lying down and would not walk because it was painful. He said, no, you have to walk. And I had to walk, step on the, on the feet of the left leg. Fortunately, the swollen leg got burst and a lot of pus water came out and then I was free. So anytime I see my left leg with the scar there, I remember <laughs> Uncle Kofi. If it, had, if it had not been him, I wouldn't know how I would be walking by this time. Maybe with a stick or maybe the leg would have even been infected and <laughs> be <cut him> <laughs> be, be amputated at that time. <laughs> he was committed to instilling in us values of kindness, integrity and service. Any time he will come down to Ghana and come and see the sister, I see him. Any time he sees me, Maud, or he will call, Maud, I've come. So, Uncle, so what should I prepare for you? So, I want palava sauce with rice plantain or pumpkin soup with rice balls. And I will quickly organize and then do it and go and give it to you. <laughs> In 1954, Kofi was enrolled at the Mfansipim School, a Methodist institution in Cape Coast, founded in the 1870s. John Kufour, the former president of Ghana, was one of Kofi's age mates and a friend as they grew up in Kumasi. Uh, the two of us were born in the year 1938. Around 53, 54, uh, was sent to a secondary school in Cape Coast, Fan Supreme School, the oldest secondary school in Ghana. Kofi Annan completed here in 1957, and he served under Mr. Battels, the first black headmaster of the school and from the records we have on him he was also a great sportsman he played hockey he was an athlete and he was even a prefect a world leadership figure and model to the many children in the world a strong pillar that helped the un unity of right from a young age kofi was always an outspoken young boy he even once organized a strike against the administration to agitate for better students' rights. The past and the present. Thank you. And even at one time when he felt the food was not all that good, he organized a demonstration, no, a positive one, just to draw attention that the food that was served was not very good. And the school took notice of that and served very quality food. Kofi's passion for truth and justice was beginning to surface at this formative stage of his life. Kofi's character of diplomacy was not only shaped in school, but also through the way of life of his people. According to Nana Apenteng, one of the Ashanti paramount chiefs and a career diplomat, the Ashanti way of life could have played a significant role in what Kofi would shape up to be. First, a lot depends upon one's uh, upbringing. You have to learn and respect your roots. You have to learn to be tolerant. You have to learn to be a good listener. And Kofi Annan's be able to treat everybody like a friend. I think it's also uh, maybe ingrained. It's something he got from, from our, our society. 
we are community centered. The Ashanti Kingdom was created towards the end of the 17th century by King Osei Tutu I. Due to aggression by the Denchira tribe, King Osei decided to unite several clans to rise up in arms against this common enemy. He established his capital in Kumasi and in its heyday, the Ashanti Kingdom spread across what is now modern day Ghana and parts of Togo. The history of the family goes as far back as 300 years. We were originally from Denchira. And uh, our head then was Abeka. So when the litigation started between the Ashantis and the Dangerous, they immigrated from Dangerous to come and back, Nanao said to the Ashanti at that time, to go and fight him. So he came with a whole army to come and support the Ashantis to go and fight the Dangerous. And it was very successful. Through an ambitious expansion program, King Osei used diplomacy to cut deals of allegiance and unite the community to neutralize the power of the Denchira. The Anan family was one such clan that joined King Osei and grew to be one of the closest and most trusted clans of the king because of their loyalty. Today, the Ashanti kingdom is recognized as a constitutionally protected subnational state in the Republic of Ghana. This history of diplomacy among the Ashanti that was passed on from generation to generation could be one among many reasons as to why Kofi Annan was such an impeccable diplomat. After his graduation in 1962, Kofi immediately joined the World Health Organization in Geneva. But Kofi would briefly come back to work in Ghana in 1974 before returning to the United Nations to take up the role of the head of personnel at the office of the High Commission for Refugees in Geneva. Kofi was a, a very peaceful person. You rather separate whoever will be fighting and says stop. So we're not surprised when he joined the UN to be an ambassador for peace. A man with a great sense of humor, Kofi managed to charm his way into the heart of Tiki Alakija. Kofi and Tiki would sire two children, Ama and Kojo, but their marriage would end up in divorce by the late 1970s. That was around the time my parents got divorced. We lived alone together in um, Geneva. Probably, I think my earliest memories are probably when I was um, two, three years old. Um, childhood memories, like any kid um, running around the house, playing. I remember you know, him probably trying to get me to bed or you know, me being a rascal. The usual father and son memories or running into his room and get his dry cleaning in those days, the shirts would come in, um, there's a cardboard, then a shirt, and I used to always get the cardboard, and then I used to draw my dr paintings or drawings in those days on those cardboard from his dry clean shirts, yeah. His charm, however, could not escape the notice of Nan, a Swedish lawyer who also worked at the United Nations. She too, like Kofi, was a young single parent with a child called Nina, from a previous marriage, they would court and finally wed in 1984. When we, when we met in Geneva, a social gathering, and I don't think uh, difficult to see that one would be uh, caught by his charisma and his warmth. So uh, obviously I was interested. He had this psychological insight which he had developed during these years and of his interest in people. So I think these characteristics would help him later in life when he was suddenly at the UN with the, all the complexities. You know, he, used, he used to say that there's more that unites us than divides us. And for us, I was Nan and he was Kofi. And we were together Kofi and Nan, not a Ghanaian, not a Swede, not a European, not an African. 
but we two human beings. And also, of course, that I love to go to Ghana. I love that warm and welcoming feeling. We made our home there, where we could gather the family, the children and the grandchildren later. And uh, he also enjoyed coming to Sweden, even if it was a bit colder. At home, life was all smooth sailing. But at the UN, everything was in a complete turmoil as the Bosnian war raged on. Boutros Ghali, the then Secretary General of the UN, was increasingly being criticized for his handling of the crisis, especially by the United States. His unpopularity came at a great advantage to Kofi, who was being touted to replace him as the next Secretary General, should he be ousted. Nevertheless, Boutros still ran unopposed for his second term of office, but the United States vetoed his candidature. This would force Boutros to suspend his application and pave the way for Kofi's candidature. Kofi would win the first round of elections, but France would veto him four times before finally abstaining. This single act would herald a new history in the making as Kofi Annan would become the first Secretary General chosen from within the staff ranks of the United Nations. I, Kofi Annan, I, Kofi Annan, solemnly swear, solemnly swear, to exercise in all loyalty, to exercise in all loyalty, discretion and conscience, discretion and conscience, the functions entrusted to me, the functions entrusted to me, as Secretary General of the United Nations, as Secretary General of the United Nations. And in so doing, the man who rose from a tiny palace in the West African country of Ghana was now at the helm of the diplomatic world. It was all a bit of a whirlwind, something propelled onto the global stage. And of course, so many things changed for the family and for our lives going forward. The weeks before, you were just Kojo Annan, some guy. And the next day, you're Kofi Annan's son, or Kofi Annan's daughter, and everyone's dynamics and body language changes towards you and looking back that that is what happened here. Yeah. Even when he got more and more responsibilities, he, he would have time. So, and he was that type of person that you felt that, you know, when you were talking to him, he was concentrating on you. In Geneva he was a single father for a while and he was sort of say, well if you want me in a meeting, then I have to do it before this and that time because after that I will have to go home and take care of Kojo. I think he was a wonderful father and really, really genuinely interested in their plans and their activities and the same with the children. Nobody is a self-made person. It's the family that makes somebody. Together we are, the better we can support each other to come forward. And the foundation have been laid down since about 300 years ago. So we are just continuing the tradition which we came to meet.